Welcome to the Healthful Woman Podcast, the fastest growing podcast in women's health. Today's Monday, December 20th, 2021. I'm joined today by Dr. Miwa Geiger to talk about congenital heart disease in newborns. Miwa is a pediatric cardiologist at Mount Sinai and specializes in fetal echocardiography. She is a terrific doctor, a wonderful person, and we have known each other since we were classmates in medical school. Miwa and I are going to discuss the role of a pediatric cardiologist for babies with congenital heart disease prior to birth and how we work together to improve outcomes after birth. All right. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. See you Thursday on High Risk Birth Stories. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman, a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Healthful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. Dr. Miwa Geiger, I'm so happy to have you here and have you on the podcast. How you doing? I'm great. How are you, Nadie? I'm I'm just wonderful. This is awesome. So Miwa, as you know, and our listeners are going to learn, you're an associate professor of pediatrics and cardiology. You're the director of the Fetal Heart Program at Mount Sinai. And most importantly, you're in the Mount Sinai class of 2001. <laughs> Me and I went to medical school together. We sat next to each other. Yeah, we sat alphabetically. So it was a uh, Fierstein Fox Geiger. Yes. Gelfand. I don't know if they do that anymore. I don't know. I don't even think they have those labs anymore. We had these like study like cubbies, I guess they were called, and, and they the sat us alphabetically. Yeah, we kept our microscope there and our books. And... We had one of the best views of Central Park. Yeah, it was really, really nice. And we had... Right. So we were literally right next to each other. You went from there to Yale for your peds residency and then out to California for cardiology and fetal echo and then back to Mount Sinai. Yeah. Wonderful. How you doing now? I'm good. I'm good. It's, uh, you know, fetal echo is something that, you know, I've found fascinating sometime during my fellowship. And it just, you know, to me, it's something that's expanding and growing and always holds your interest. So, you know, I'm glad I made this choice. It was kind of luck. I just thought it was cool. But yeah, I'm happy. What percentage of your practice is seeing fetuses, meaning moms who are pregnant, versus seeing the babies or children afterwards, would you say? Well, I would say, honestly, it's about most of my time, if you divvy it, let's say a week, is um, spent reading echoes. I only see patients usually about one day a week. Sometimes I add on here and there, but usually I see kids one day a week for a full day. Um, and I usually do fetal echoes about 10 to 12 patients once a week. And then the other days I'm reading echoes. Excellent. And we had a podcast about fetal echoes uh, from the OB slash MFM side with Jen Lamb. So we're not going to rehash everything with you, although we did at the time talk about sort of our relationship with you guys and pediatric cardiology and how that's so important back and forth. But I wanted to focus today more on the congenital heart disease side of it, because it's not just the diagnosis, obviously, which is sort of what we focus on the ultrasound, but it's a whole world of diagnosis, management, surgery, medication, follow-up, counseling, anxiety, reassurance. And this is like the world basically you're in. Pretty yeah. much all the time, I mm -hmm. assume. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of congenital heart disease, you know, it's about 1% of births, give or take, a little bit less, you know, plus minus. How wide of a range is that, if I just say congenital yeah. heart disease? It's a huge range. I mean, it's getting better and better, but, you know, initially the things that get picked up prenatally are the obvious things that are just like the heart is really different than normal. And then there's other defects or subtle abnormalities that we may not even pick up by fetal echo. So we do have sort of our disclaimer of things that we cannot rule out, even mm -hmm. if it looks normal. So I would say a large percentage are the more, I suppose they're minor or, you know, when you're the mom, it's not minor if there's a hole in the heart, but holes in the heart is, is you know, sort of the most common detected abnormality. And then the other thing that's common, but not always detected is something called bicuspid aortic valve. When you have two aortic valve leaflets functionally instead of three. Right. So those are the most, you know, if you're 
studying for your boards are the kind of most common things. Um, and those are the things that actually don't always get detected by fetal echo. Fetal echo, the better it gets, the more you can detect these subtle nuances. But, you know, especially in the beginning, a lot of these things were the, the severe things that are a little more rare. Um, but, you know, having one pumping chamber instead of two, that's, uh, that's more obvious, so it'll get picked up. By the way, the sort of number one high yield indication for getting a fetal echo is that someone like yourself mm -hmm. uh, picks up something. All these other reasons that we have to do echoes, diabetes, family history even, usually end up being normal. Whereas, you know, when there is congenital heart disease, it's usually someone who didn't have any of these risk factors and it's random. So that's why it's so important for the OBs and MFMs who are doing the screening, who are actually looking on the anatomy scan, do, a, you know, a great job like you guys do at picking up, you know, sometimes subtle things. But yeah, a lot of congenital heart disease is on the more minor side, mm -hmm. but those may not be the ones that we pick up. Right. And it's it's so interesting, I think, the difference between my perspective and your perspective in that when I see these women and we suspect uh, congenital heart disease, or we know that there's congenital heart disease, we're really focused on the pregnancy to the birth. But when you're seeing them, you're focused on the pregnancy to the birth and then beyond. So the conversation with you is going to be much different from the one with me. With me, it's all right, what are we doing during pregnancy? How often are my visits? You know, when am I going to deliver? How am I going to deliver? Where am I going to deliver? Fine. But with you, they're talking about what's my child going to be like when he or she's 50. Right. And you have to go into all of that. And how much of that do you get into right away? Or how does that journey work? Someone sees you and there's a congenital heart disease. How do you address that? I mean, the more I do this, the more I learn, and, I, and I've definitely changed over the years. So now I kind of try to give the big picture a little bit more in terms of, you know, when you sit down, it also, every family is different. So they have a different educational background, language barriers sometimes coming from different social backgrounds, but kind of try to assess how much they know so far about what's going on. Some have come in from, you know, the MFM's office and they, they know some things up, but I sort of try to give a little bit of a big picture, like this is sort of medium severity, or this is quite minor, you know, it should be fixed with one surgery and, you know, life will be normal after that. And then go into the details and you do have to sort of assess each, I guess, uh, woman or, or couple on how much they want to know. I used to, when I first came out of fellowship, I used to give them a lot of information about what the baby would look like after birth, the procedures that would be required, and sort of get them step-by-step step through, say, early adulthood. And it's a long consult. But then you realize, and what the thing that has made me change the way I do things is that at a certain point, if they're in shock, they don't really hear past the first two sentences or so. And that's normal, right? And so it's hard because you do feel as a physician obligated to tell them as much as you know, and some of them want to know every detail. But sometimes if it's the first time they're hearing this, they're not going to be able to absorb most of what you say. And there are studies that look at how much, you know, they feel they absorb or how much, you know, kind of get a little quiz about the anatomy and, and prenatally diagnosed versus postnatally diagnosed. And even and the ones that are diagnosed after birth, also the family gets explained, but they're in so much shock that they can't absorb. So sometimes we do it stepwise. I mean, if it, I kind of give them the big picture, if there's consideration of not continuing a pregnancy, then I try to give them the big picture of how involved the care is going to be, you know, if this is going to be something that's going to limit their lifestyle or um, quality of life, let's say, which is subjective, obviously, so that's tough. But, you know, how many surgeries would they need during childhood, say? How long will they be in the hospital the first after they're born. So those are kind of big things that people want to know. And are they going to be on medications seems is a very popular question. But sometimes you just have to <clears throat> slowly ease them into it as the visits go on. So we typically see patients, depending on what the fetal diagnosis is, about every four weeks. And that's not always, you know, we take the pictures and see if anything's changed because things can change with certain disease categories. But it's also an opportunity to, for you to get the know the family better, for them to know their physician. We try to have the same doctor see the same patient each time, and the family's learning and they're absorbing things. And they're you know there's an initial stage for significant heart disease, a sort of grief for a normal pregnancy. Uh, they were anticipating having yeah. a normal baby, and this is sort of a, even though they're continuing the pregnancy and they know that the child's going to need you know some heart surgery. Um, it is there is a period of grief, and um, I think people also depends on how you adapt to that, but get over it and kind of take more practical steps. And I see the couple ch kind of changing and how they are moving forward with the pregnancy and more practical. How many more visits should I be induced and all that stuff? So I kind of slowly try to 
paint the picture over time. But definitely the first visit is tough because you kind of have to, if you're making a decision about yeah. continuing the pregnancy or not, you kind of have to give sort of the big picture of what you expect. And of course, there's uncertainties. So, you know, fetal echo has gotten really good at some picking up some of the very subtle things or minor things, but the physiology changes after the baby's born. And sometimes we can't predict how things are going to go or things can happen that are unexpected. So, you know, one of the things that we do talk about is uncertainties and certain things that, that heart disease is certain. Sometimes patients hope that I'm uncertain about there being heart disease. Right. That usually isn't the case, but what's going to happen? And so that is also something that is challenging. Some, you know, and a lot of it is how comfortable families are accepting some degree of uncertainty. Yeah. I think what you said is really important because there's the ultrasound imaging, which can have uncertainty, meaning this is a subtle finding. I don't know. But when we have a diagnosis, usually like all right, the ultrasound, the pictures, it's its basically as good as it's yeah. going to be after birth. We know what's going on. But as you said, there's uncertainty because number one, you could have a diagnosis and there could be a wide range of outcomes, right? You could have some babies who have a certain condition and they do perfectly fine and they will or will not need surgery and they'll be healthy and live long, you know, productive, happy lives and everything versus the exact same called a lesion, right? Is when there's an abnormality in the heart. And it goes horribly wrong and the kids are very sick. And so there's always a range. It can be, say, someone like, you know, someone's going to have diabetes, right? There's people with diabetes who are perfectly healthy and do great. And there's others who are very, very sick. Some of that is based on treatment and some of that's just luck as far as we know. And that that's other uncertainty. And the final uncertainty is when we diagnose them, we don't always know the extent of it, right? Because then there's, well, is there a genetic component? Do we have to do an amnio? Then there's time for testing and also with you know, there's a whole business about whether the children, if they have congenital heart disease, will there be sort of an effect on the brain during the surgery? And so there's a lot of variables we just can't know at the time of diagnosis. Right. So the other thing is, as we detect these things early and earlier, I know you guys are doing you know early anatomy yeah. scans at 16 weeks, but sometimes we get patients that are 12 weeks. We find something and things can change during the pregnancy as sure. the fetus is growing. If this side of the heart does not grow accordingly, then it's a whole nother pathway than if it does grow pretty well. And then, you know, it kind of dictates the the type of surgeries and how, you know, honestly, how, how complex the surgeries are going to be. And that is something that one of the reasons that we see people every four weeks is to see how things are progressing or not progressing. The structures can change, you know, things can change. You can see one thing at 20 weeks and then at 30 weeks, it's different. Right. So that's another uncertainty. But as you mentioned, the other really important focus that, you know, I would say over the last 10 to 15 years has been the brain and how children with congenital heart disease, you know, there have been definitely studies that have shown areas where they are behind, but not all. And that's something that's not predictable. So that's an uncertainty because we do have patients who have fairly complex congenital heart defects who are completely, you know, going to college, having normal jobs, you would never know unless you saw them without a shirt on that they yeah. had anything wrong. And then you see patients that need a lot of help with school. You know, something that's fairly common is ADHD and depression in the in cases of significant heart disease. So that's obviously not predictable prenatally. And that actually is probably more impactful for your quality of life and your family's life than whether they had surgery or not. You know, the surgery happens, they get out of the hospital, you might have to take some medications, you might have to see a cardiologist every year. But the day-to-day -day stuff, like how they're doing in school or behavior, is you know, is actually you know harder to predict, but probably more important. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that makes a lot of sense. As a parent, it's going to be more day-to-day, -day, right? Again, because most kids, if their heart gets fixed, so to speak, they'll do well. And from a physiology standpoint, uh, some don't, but most will. But if someone, if the child grows up and has you know learning issues and you know, anxiety and depression, that's going to be tough. Yeah. Do you find it helpful when you're initially talking to And you mentioned things like, well, it's minor or not. I mean, there's all these sort of cat, you know, the way we categorize heart disease and clinical or not clinical or cyanotic or not cyanotic and ductal dependent and not ductal dependent. Are those things that are helpful to you when counseling? Are those just helpful in terms of your own categorization and maybe with your fellows and residents and whatnot. Usually critical and non-critical is related to ductal dependent. Right. And, and so that is helpful in the sense that people know how to treat the baby when they come out. So if it's a ductal dependent, so for the listeners, um, the ductus arteriosus is a blood vessel that connects the main two arteries, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. That's part of the normal fetal circulation that normally is sort of programmed to close once the baby is starting to breathe on its own and out. But in certain heart defects, you actually want that to stay open because there's not enough blood flow 
to the lung artery or to the body artery. And so sometimes we want to keep it open and there's a medication that's given intravenously that can keep it open. So if you, one of the main purposes, and I think especially early on in fetal echo is to just to figure out, is this what we call ductal dependent? Do we need to give the prostaglandin to keep the baby alive in the first day of life or not? And then we sort out the details after birth. And so that's sort of just a language we use amongst say, uh, neonatologists mm -hmm. and you know MFMs and cardiologists to say this baby goes needs to go to the NICU it needs to get an IV it needs to get started on prostaglandin and then sometimes we're wrong so sometimes we keep that open but then it turns out okay well, actually there's a little bit more blood flow to the lungs than we thought let's try stopping the medication and if there's enough blood flow to the lungs in a controlled setting of being in the NICU then actually we can send the baby home with close follow up and they don't need that medication or if it's the other way around they get too blue or cyanotic, you know that we need to do a surgery or a cath procedure before the baby goes home. So that's sort of mainly for the providers, I would say. Right. And then the other category I would say is sort of, you know, for the family in terms of like, people want to know, some people don't, they want to know every detail and they're going to look up the diagnosis online and, and all this, do a lot of research. But some people just want to know, like, is my baby going to be normal or not? Right? right. And so, you know, it depends what you mean by normal, but I kind of think like there are certain defects, so it's a medium, like they have two ventricles, which are the two pumping chambers, but they will need one or more surgeries over say 20 years that will to sort of keep things going in the right direction. So I would say that's sort of medium. I would think that the first question they say is, Do my, does my baby need surgery? Surgery, yeah. And so yeah. sometimes that's even hard to detect. For example, yeah. relatively simple, something with a hole in the heart. So holes in the heart, between, can be between the top chambers, ASDs, or the bottom chambers, VSDs. ASDs are very hard to diagnose prenatally because they're supposed to be an opening there. Uh, VSDs are holes between the bottom chambers of the heart that are not supposed to be there, but sometimes we cannot see them and sometimes we can't see them. Both of those things, though, after birth, don't make anyone sick at birth. And usually those babies, if that's all they have, can just go to the regular nursery. And those holes can get smaller with time, depending on the location and size. And so I can't say sometimes if someone's going to need surgery, if they have a hole in their heart, because it may get smaller and close or it may get so small that it, we feel it's not necessary to do surgery. So some of those things, that's one of the uncertainties. But for example, like the medium defects, those are things that you know will need surgery, tetralogy of fallot, mm -hmm. AV canal. I would say those are, you're going to have biventricular circulation, meaning you have two pumping chambers and you can make the blood go the correct way. You may need one surgery, but you may need tune-ups. Kind of sometimes if you have tetralogy of fallot, you have your initial surgery, but then you might need pulmonary valve replacements every 10 to 15 years. So that's sort of, I would say, kind of a medium level heart defect disease because you definitely need something and that you have to go to the cardiologist and you may need something again. But in general, people do well with, you know, with those things. First year may be a little bit tough for the family, but generally people do well. And then there's the more severe categories where they probably don't have one of the pumping chambers adequately you know, sized or their valves are situated in a way that we can't actually have the blood flow going to the correct pumping chamber. And so some of those patients undergo what we call a palliation or single ventricle pathway, which is when one pumping chamber is doing all the work and the blood flow gets redirected by surgeries to go passively to the lungs. And so those babies these days are now doing better and better, but still those patients, I would say, have more limitations. They have a long-term complications, usually by their you know 20s or 30s. Some of them will need heart transplants by the times they're adults, occasionally as teenagers. Some do well, and some are doing okay, but you know not really able to do sports. They have exercise right. limitations, and those patients are probably the highest group that are going to have areas where they're neurodevelopmentally you know behind, uh, but some are not. And so that's those. That's sort of the spectrum of things that can happen. All of those that you know minor, medium, severe are kind of the categories I try to explain to the family in the sense that also sort of also describes how sick the baby could be in the first month because those single ventricle type lesions are things that those babies can get sick after after surgery right. more easily. And it's also hard because when you talk about, you know, let's, you know, mild, medium and severe, which is all true, when we talk about outcomes, we talk about outcomes in 2021. But when these babies are 20 year olds, it's gonna be twenty 41 or 2042 if they're pregnant now and who knows like maybe in 2042 you can get you know for heart transplant maybe you can order on amazon in 20 years i mean it's, it's, i don't think so but it, it's we just don't know and if you think about 20 years ago if they had to predict what we're doing now or 20 years before then 
it's hard even to envision what it's going to be like. And that's another thing. It may be you know, doom and gloom now, and it may be better in 20 years, or maybe no different. We right. just don't know. There's just not that many adults, you know, over, say, 60 with congenital heart disease. But, for example, at our adult congenital heart disease clinic now, we see plenty of 30, 40-year-olds, some 50-year-olds, depending on what they had, and, you know, pretty normal lives. I mean, some of them have exercise limitations. A lot of them do have kids, though, depending on you know, if they're sure. men, obviously easier. But, and... There are definitely things, especially catheter-based procedures. For example, those pulmonary valve replacements, there's more and more options for catheter-based pulmonary valve right. replacements. Meaning not having a major incision and right. opening your heart to do it. It's, An overnight yeah. stay in the hospital, you know, you do go under, but compared to having everything opened up again and going on, you know, the heart-lung machine bypass, you may not have to do that as frequently. Um, so I do, I mean, I do mention that to families when I'm counseling them that for certain diseases, we actually might have better options. I can't predict exactly what they're going to be. But for sure, the people are working on all those things, minimally invasive approaches to the surgeries even themselves, or better surgical techniques. People are always working to make their surgeries better. Right. How often do you find that either you or the couple are interfacing with the heart surgeon as well? Meaning if it's something that's, let's say the mild ones where you're pretty sure they're not going to need surgery, fine. But in the medium, as you called it, in the severe Do they always meet with the surgeon? Do you always speak to the surgeon before and go over it? How does that work logistically? So I just came from doing that. We pretty much offer anyone who wants to meet with a surgeon access to one of our surgeons. You know, certainly anything where I think for sure the baby will need a surgery before going home from the hospital the initial time, we are going to have them have recommend a consult with with the surgeon. So most families take us up on that. Some Say, oh, I'll just wait until the baby's born. I mean, either way, the surgeon has to meet with them immediately before surgery to do the consent. But most families do want to see, like, put a face to the name and and see the surgeon, even though they'll usually say there's uncertainties. We'll see when the baby is born. They do kind of want to meet the person that's operating on their child. The ones that are sort of uncertain, I give them the option, hole in the heart that may get smaller. If you want to meet the surgeon, you can. Some of them kind of want to be optimistic. Like, I'm not going to meet the surgeon. I don't think the baby's going to need anything. Right. I leave it up to them. I mean, something like, for example, bicuspid valve, it's very hard to diagnose prenatally, but I suspect sometimes, right, that something's slightly abnormal with the valve. If the blood flow is going okay and I don't think the baby's going to need anything, I don't necessarily offer it unless they, unless they really ask. If, or the other option is sometimes they just will need a cap procedure. So... Um, aortic stenosis or pulmonary valve stenosis is when the valve is not opening well. Oftentimes in newborns, we can, especially the pulmonary valve, open it up uh, pretty well, and that might be their only intervention. So we do have the um, interventional cardiologists meet with the families just to give them sort of, you know, they sometimes show them the balloon or something, you know, they kind of uh, describe the, the procedure and their statistics. Sometimes parents are very numbers based and want to know how many of these have you done, et cetera. So we definitely give that, uh, give parents an option to meet with either of them. Yeah. And it's also sometimes confusing because for people who are not in this world, right, there's the cardiologist who sort of treats the the baby, the child, and does ultrasounds and reads them and medications. And if there's admissions to the hospital, they follow them. This, that. Then there's interventional cardiologists, which is the same person. But on top of that, they do procedures, yeah. sticking catheters and vessels and, you know, into the heart and whatnot. And then there's the pediatric surgeons who are actually not cardiologists. They're surgeons who operate on the heart. And so they do operations on the heart. And I, everyone works as a team, but it's hard for people to always understand, wait, like they're thinking oh, yeah. you're doing their surgery and the, and the and the surgeon is going to be the one seeing the baby, you know, afterwards. And it's it, it's a little bit confusing, yeah. I imagine. Yeah, for sure. I definitely get asked like, so when you're operating on the baby, you know, like, wait, wait, I'm, I'm just diagnosing. I'm just telling them what to do. But we work really close. I mean, most centers, you know, we are kind of at a medium sized center, but we have meetings about the patients before surgery. And nowadays I'm actually having sometimes we have patients transferring in to see us that I'm having consultations with us, MFM, and maybe neurology, depending on what the specific thing is, kind of the same day and sometimes the same exact time. So everyone's on the same page about the delivery planning. They might meet the surgeon once or twice max before they're operating. They don't know ultimately what's going to happen until after the baby's born. But I think it's good to get a sense of obviously who this person is. Some parents are also choosing between hospitals um, if they have that option. And also just some expectations. They'll surgeon say, yes, assuming it is what we think it is, this is something I do one a week. This is something that I expect to do well. And you know that's helpful. Or if on the opposite, they'll say, listen, this is something that we do, but 
the outcomes aren't so good. Yeah. And that's important information for parents to know, both from the cardiologist and also from the surgeon. I mean, and usually they're going to be similar, like you're going to be aligned in your counseling, but not always. And there's different perspectives. I mean, surgeons sometimes have different follow-up than you do, or different people interpret the same data differently, right? right. So you, like, for example, a child who's alive, but limited in sports and has learning issues, some people might say that's a bad outcome. Some people say that's an amazing outcome based on where you're starting. Yeah. I mean, it's just sort of, a, it's a lot of its perspective and parents look at this differently. It's a very tough topic to talk about because you're taking parents who it's like dropping an anvil on them, right? Everyone knows the heart, right? This is an organ everyone sort of gets is important. And you're saying it's not normal. It's not built normal. And there may be issues and the baby might need surgery. And, you know, the baby might have health issues and potentially may not survive. And how do you do that? Right? I mean, I'm curious how you do it. I know how we do it. We have a different organs in different situations. But what have you learned or is it, since you and I were in the same class, I know how many times you've been around the block like I have. And so we've been doing this for a while. I'm curious, you mentioned before how you do it differently from you, but just walk us through how that conversation yeah. goes and what types of things come up a lot. So one thing I would say is it, it doesn't always go the same. And it like sometimes there's personality differences. So you know, I try as much as possible to be understanding and kind, but sometimes the personalities don't click. So every now and then I'll have a patient that I had a hard time connecting with and they may want to see another doctor that happened recently. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I do take it personally. I don't, I don't want to say I, I don't take it personally. I take it personally because I think, well, what could I have done better in mm -hmm. talking to this family? Um, in this particular case, I think it was, you know, I kind of felt like I had to paint the full picture and some of the things were not so good. And this family had been trying really hard and they were going to continue no matter what. And they didn't want to hear the word termination. So, but you kind of have to also feel like you did right by yourself in terms of what, what you're supposed to say and, and have the documentation of that you've discussed all the possible outcomes. So I think, you know, you have to talk about what, I think you at least have to mention what the diagnosis is and then the scale of severity to some mm -hmm. extent. And then I, what I usually do is I ask them what they do for their occupation or, and just to see if they have any science background and things like that. But I still, no matter what, draw my own picture of the heart, normal and in a fetal circulation, and then the change that happens between fetal circulation and at birth so that they know that there's differences between inside and outside and um, how that change can actually change in a normal fetus, but also in a baby that has a heart defect. And so why certain structures, like for example, the ductus arteriosus is supposed to close, why we keep it open and cetera. So I kind of also explain how the placental blood flow goes into the heart. And then I draw a picture of what their baby has and explain sort of why at birth we expect maybe the baby's oxygen saturation to be a little bit low or um, maybe not enough blood flow to the body unless the the ductus arteriosus is kept open. And then I sort of try to go in a very simple way, try as much as possible. There's always time limitations, but I try to allow for time for questions after each step. So once I'm explaining the anatomy and physiology of normal, ask them if they have questions, then their baby, I ask them, I ask them if they have questions. And sometimes it doesn't go in the exact order that we plan. So, you know, if they don't have a lot of questions and after I explain what their baby has, then I explain what we expect uh, the baby to look like after birth, what the plan would be in terms of going to the NICU, when the surgery typically would be recommended, what the surgeries are. I also, if it's complex, like for example, single ventricle, they typically need three surgeries by the age of four. I do say that. And then I ask them, do you want me to explain the individual surgeries? Some people, yes, they want everything exactly told to them. Some of them are like, Kind of, but I'm not going to remember. That's fine. Just you've heard the names and I write it down. And I also have someone, I think it's really good to have someone else in the room with you. You know, it can't always, you know, if you're in private practice, you may not have this, but we have our coordinator who's an NP, Amanda. She stays in the room with us and takes notes for the family so that they don't feel like, oh, you know, I forgot what she said or whatever. So it's also written in my note, but, and sometimes we have patients record um, right. what, what I say or their partner's not there and needs to hear. So I kind of ask them how much detail they want in terms of the actual surgeries. A lot of them do want to know sort of percentages of outcomes, like how many do well or how many die and, and that kind of thing, which we try to estimate. But it's hard because if say, even like it's 
80% survival. What you don't know if your baby is in the 20% that doesn't. Right. So it's, I mean, I, I try to give those numbers if we have them, but it's hard because that doesn't always tell you what your baby has. And so the other thing that I do, and I, this is something that might be different amongst cardiologists, and it's hard because when I'm counseling patients, I know how I do it. Amanda knows how I do it, but I don't see other attendings, other pediatric cardiologist counsel because if they're there, I'm not there. But what I do, and I know some people don't do this, is if I have a feeling of which way it's going to go. So for some key uh, example would be, is this baby going to have one ventricle or two? So sometimes the ventricle is sort of medium small, and you don't know if they're going to be able to tolerate a normal, we call cardiac output, which is after birth, both ventricles have to be able to pump equal amount of blood. Whereas in utero, one side compensates for the other. So that's one of the things that changes after birth. And so if I have some data, like there's research for a reason. So, you know, if I have some data that most babies with a valve size, this size, if it continues to grow, should be able to have a two ventricle repair, then I kind of tell them that I think most likely, can I be wrong? Yes. But if I had to guess if things continue the way they're going, I think that they will have, you know, two ventricles. Some people don't like to do that and make any promises. We don't know. I mean, they don't like to predict. Right. And I've come across it. Like, we really will just have to see after the baby's born. Do you think that's a function of experience or a function of personality? Because I would think that with more experience, yeah. you're more comfortable making predictions because you've seen it more times versus yeah. if you're just getting it from a textbook or your training, which is a few years, right. you're less comfortable with that type of um, statement or prediction. That's what I thought because for myself, I would say that I've become a little bit, you know, I have experience. You know, you read some papers on it that I have to say research in fetal definitely has a lot of work and fetal cardiology has a lot of work. And that's why there's an effort to make more multicenter studies because these heart defects are relatively rare. One center may only have like one or two right. of these a year. So to compile the data in the same sort of treatment era is really difficult. But, you know, you do have these this information and you have what's happened in the past with you and your other patients. And so I, I try to best predict, but I don't know. I mean, I've also seen quite senior people not really yeah. like to not to commit because they don't want to make any promises they can't keep, which I which I understand that, too. I mean, I always say if there's a good chance either way, I describe both scenarios. Obviously, you know, usually one is better than the other, but not necessarily. And, um, you know, if I have some information, either positive or not positive, I am going to give it. I want to try to have the family be as prepared as possible. If I feel like the baby has a really good chance of not making it through the first surgery, you know, I would, I will say that because that's sort of realistic. And from there, it goes on. I mean, I would say that's usually the first visit. If someone has critical lesion and it's the prognosis is not good, but no matter what, they're continuing the pregnancy and, you know, they're going to be hopeful, then I'm not going to take that away each time. Right. So, you know, at subsequent visits, I'm not going to say, again, your baby only has, you know, I will, you know, we're going to do our best. and Because and, there's no upside. There's no point. Right. There's yeah. no point. They're continuing. We're, we're still going to do our best. We're going to do everything possible to make sure the baby is in best condition as, po as possible. So I think there's a big difference between that first visit if, if there are people that are going to try and make it. And you have to assess, you know, sometimes it's like a taboo topic to some people to bring up termination, but that's something that as long as it's being offered in this state, we are going to say that is something that some people will do for severe or even medium, you know, heart defects. And it's a very personal decision and you have to offer it. And I think once the family has made the decision, then we don't bring it up again. Yeah, I, I would say that over the years uh, in my practice, just by doing it for more time, I've definitely learned more in terms of the knowledge base, right? You continue to learn every day, every week. But I would say my learning and how to talk to people has been far more yes. than my learning of the actual conditions. Like my understanding of, you know, birth defects on ultrasound is greater than it was 10 years ago. But my understanding of how to talk to people about it is infinitely greater compared to that. And I think that it's, it is such a difficult thing to do because on the one hand, you want to be realistic, right? You want to tell them facts, like that's your job, right? You're a professional. They're coming to you for information, for knowledge, for experience, and so you're not trying to sugarcoat a bad thing and you're not trying to, you know, make something to, you know, just focus on the negative. You're trying to be realistic, but it's hard to do because also you have to react to how they're reacting, right? So if you mentioned that there might be something bad and they break down that it's horrible, your inclination is say, no, 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 it's not so bad, right? And then you, then you might be sugarcoating it. And the flip side, if you tell someone something and it, it's pretty clear they don't get that there is a risk here. You don't want to just beat them down and say, no, it's going to be bad. It could be bad. And so you have to really, it, 
people say it's an art and sort of a cliche, but it's true. It's really an art and different people do it differently and some are better at it than others. And it's also very hard because we don't get training other than just being thrown into a room and being told when you're a resident or fellow, you got to talk to someone about watch this. Watch how this person yeah, does Yeah. It. It's hard to do formal training and it's it's just hard and something that takes experience. I know this is something you think about a lot and you've been doing some research on yeah. as well. So so tell us about that, about that aspect of it, just the counseling component of this whole field. Right. So, I mean, one thing, so two separate issues on that. So one is I was um, lucky enough to be involved in a, a study with some people who are in psychology and psychiatry about the trauma that a family, you know, just like the grief, say, of a normal pregnancy and things that you say and how you behave actually can impact the rest of the pregnancy. And we know stress during pregnancy is not good, um, mm -hmm. actually, for neurodevelopmental outcomes. There's some evidence about that court, maternal cortisol levels and things like that. So traumatizing the family is not the way to go, but sometimes you can't help it. And so one term that I recently became aware of is something called trauma-informed care, um, where you are aware that you're going to about to inflict trauma on this family. And then it's not doesn't mean you're not going to, no matter what, if you hear, you can't sugarcoat it to the point where you have to tell them that there's a heart defect. But if you sort of have it in the back of your mind that this is going to be a pivotal moment for you, it's just another day at work. But for the patient, this is like a day they will never forget. And some people mark time before or after they met you as big changes in their life, their whole life changed after this day. So just being aware of how you speak to the family the words you use, some people, you know, eye contact, empathizing with the family, this is a difficult situation, reiterating that it was nothing that they did that caused this. I mean, there's a lot of guilt associated also, especially with congenital heart disease, but I imagine other defects, any birth defects, I think moms tend to feel responsible in some way. And so reassuring the family, this is not anything they did. So just being aware, even if you don't have so much training in psychiatry or psychology, that this is going to be you know, potentially a traumatic event for this family. And also it can impact how the family bonds with the child. So this actually could impact the child after birth, because if a family was so traumatized by this, that they never, some people don't bond well with the, with the child or just anxiety, having anxious parents, um, you know, does impact the child's quality of life and, and how they're raised or being treated like they you know, are in a glass box. Um, so there's different things in, in terms of like how you present this to the family. As you mentioned training, um, one of my um, former fellows, Jenna Keel and I are looking at that and we just surveyed cardiologists, although other people like MFMs counsel too. We're never trained in terms of how to break bad news really, except maybe in the last 10 years, if you went through medical school, I think there's probably more courses than we had about how to break bad news. Um, but usually it's in the setting of a terminal illness, cancer is, you know, one of the main things that I think if you're in oncology, that's something you definitely have training in how to break bad news to some extent. But in cardiology, it's not exactly, you know, terminal. It's something that's going to take a lot of work, but, you know, it, it's not this exact same thing as palliative um, care in all cases, sometimes it is. So that aspect of training, we really haven't had. So we're trained initially, at least, um, is to make the right diagnosis, to understand the physiology, and to some extent, how to explain the physiology. But we're not taught how to talk about these things and what the best way to do it is. And that's something that, you know, as I mentioned, I'm still working on. There's still sometimes aspects like, oh, I don't think that went, you know, I didn't really feel like I conveyed everything to that family. You know, I, I'll call them back sometimes and say like, you know, do you have any questions? I often do that after the initial meeting. Two days later, I might call them and just ask them if they have additional questions that they didn't ask or anything I can clarify or I didn't explain clearly enough. Because it is a lot to explain in one session. Usually we have like one hour. And it's something that cardiologists are just now, I think, recognizing we need to have more training in. Most people, just as most things in medicine, you watch your attending physician do it, and then you try it yourself, you know, that see one, teach one, do one, uh, or do one, teach one, and it depends who you are watching. And it's changed. So there's people who are very senior who do it the same way. And there's vi huge variation we found in our survey of who talks about other things. So everyone talks about what the diagnosis is, but not everyone discusses the neurodevelopmental outcomes we found out. Maybe they do it, but they weren't taught how to do it. I, I wasn't taught how to do it, actually. I think when I was graduating fellowship, 
you know, a while ago, those things were just becoming well known or starting to become known about the neurodevelopmental associations. So we didn't really, weren't taught on that. But also the genetic associations, not everyone mentions those. Not oh, everyone mentions the possibility of termination or comfort care. And not everyone brings up extra cardiac anomalies that may be associated with this, but you may not detect them prenatally. Like they may, right. you know, other, a kidney problem or a brain problem that we may not see prenatally. So there's a huge, so those are the things that are sort of recommended to discuss that are not just the heart disease, but not everyone discusses them. And it's sort of up to who you are and what you remember to do that day. So we start to, now we're trying to make a checklist of the things that need to be discussed. And you try to get through all of them. You may not, you may miss one thing and call them back later. But, you know, I have my nurse practitioner sitting with me. And so I ask, like, is there anything else I'm forgetting to talk about? Because it's going to be a very emotional meeting and you get uh, side check because they ask, you know, it's fine. We ask questions out of order of what I was planning on talking about. They want to know about how they do in school after I just discussed the anatomy. And so we go, you know, from hop to topic to topic. So you just to regroup, I think it is a good idea to have sort of a, a checklist in your mind or actually on paper of the things that you want to talk about. But yes, that is something that for sure needs work. And I think in the future, we're, you know, hoping that this gets more attention and there's more um, unified teaching on in, in, in fellowship. Yeah. Um, because this is something that I think as an attending as a after fellowship in the first five years, you know, I worked on a lot. Yeah. And it's hard because not only is it something we're not trained on, but like anything, different people have different aptitude for it. Some people are very good at talking about uncertainty and talking to people who are in grief and denial, like all these things, that, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, like it comes up and some people are very comfortable in that room talking to people going through a trauma and other people are just not, it's not their thing. And, but you have to do it. And so just like, you know, if you're going to be a surgeon, you know, and you have a, you know, you're, you're not so good at throwing a suture, well, you better learn how to throw a suture. Like it's just something you have to do. And so, but not everyone picks it up as easily. So when we train surgeons, we look at them and we say, all right, this person has, is very good at this and needs help with something else. And another person might be the exact opposite, but you know, we're just talking about scratching the surface, just the things that need to be talked about. Yeah. But then how? how do you get someone who's not so good at that or someone who's not so great at eye contact or someone who's maybe a little bit more shy or more just whatever. It's just not their thing. They're not people, people. And they're really good at making the diagnosis and they're really good technically. And it's challenging and like anything in training and it's, it's hard. That's also a question we asked in our study. We asked, you know, were you taught techniques on how to talk to families or how to be empathetic and, and things like that? Most were like, no. Some people have gotten feedback, like you needed to be, I don't know, make more con eye contact, but that was the minority. So the goal would be that you have some kind of curriculum for trainees that you actually, it's uncomfortable, but you actually get told these are the things that are important too. So, you know, a few things like empathy, you know, just acknowledging that this is difficult. I think that's something that Terry Tacey, someone who's in, at Stanford, right. told me that actually there are some studies that say just acknowledging that it's difficult actually helped families retain more of what you right. told them. Validating. Yes. Yeah. Because they started like, okay, you know, I feel comfortable with this. I'm going to start paying attention again to what the, the anatomy is or whatever. So I think if you are just feeling disconnected from the person, like this person is saying words I don't know. So that's the other thing, using too many medical term and all, yeah. you know, terms. And it's going over my head and just like, it's just like, you know, you're not hearing anything. It's just going over my head at that point, they're not going to notice. So I think having stopping and assessing, you know, do you want to keep going? Do you want to take a break? I can't have to say sometimes I don't do it. Sometimes, you know, I feel like this parent has this question, I get to that and we kind of, you know, get through all of it and they need a couple hours and then we have to regroup in a, in a week or so. But that is something that I think does need some kind of formal because as you said, it's not uniform. Some people are not good at it, but that's something that they have to have at least a minimum aptitude. Yeah, some at, proficiency. At yeah. yeah. I think we were lucky. I mean, I, in our medical school, Mount Sinai, they were a little bit ahead of the curve with these types of things. I know that I did a um, uh, an elective rotation in palliative care and I learned so much during you know those two weeks. And we already back then, you're talking 150 years ago when we were in medical school, we already had that whole, the Morshan Center yeah. where they brought in sort of like actor type patients and we would practice talking to them. So the simulated patients, I mean, they're not the mannequins, they're humans, but they're simulating, I mean, they're not actually sick, but they were pretending to be sick. Yeah, like in the and, Seinfeld episode. Yes. <laughs> and, so, and so we were, you know, we had to train how to talk to them. And in our fellowship, it wasn't, every fellowship has their own sort of set of training, but I know that now, at least for MFM, there is some 
curriculum in terms of like delivering bad news and how to do these things. And it is something that's being pushed in, a, in an agenda in a good way, but it's just difficult because, and you know, so who are the people teaching it? Maybe they're not very good at it either, you right. know? And so, so it's the hard. other thing is actually getting patient feedback. Yeah. Um, so I know there are some people who, you know, in psychiatry and psychology and some of them in different areas like neonatology or oncology who have act. And there's actually a couple of studies in cardiology and like what were, what was helpful and yeah. what wasn't helpful. Just well, we find quotes. out on Yelp very quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very, very quickly. Yeah. We all find out on Google reviews yes. how we did <laughs> within minutes usually. Yes. So yeah, I mean, there's like, you know, specific things that I think, well, I guess that I didn't think about that, but yeah, that's, I, there's one paper um, out of uh, LA that, the parents really didn't like it or felt it was more severe if you use the term rare. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I didn't think that that held such a negative or positive connotation rare, but people think of rare as, oh, they're not going to survive. To me, rare just doesn't happen yeah. often. So sometimes they do great and it has something rare. Switch to uncommon or something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's like, but sometimes that gets interpreted. The word you say, for example, this the word rare as terminal, but to us, it's not. It's just we don't see it a lot, but it may be, you may be fine. So I think I didn't know that that, that was so bad. And um, the eye contact, mentioning some people didn't like that people, it's a heart, right? So some people didn't like that it was termination was brought up a lot. Some people thought that they should have been offered it and they weren't offered it. You know, it's, like, it's almost hard to please everybody, right? right? But, and as you know, different social backgrounds and educational backgrounds. But I think there is some, you know, need to get feedback from patients who've been through this so that we can, you know, help develop a curriculum. Totally agree. I think that some of the, like you said, you not everyone needs the same thing. Uh, I do think the eye contact, not using a lot of medical terminology uh, is very helpful. I think that giving people an opportunity to either come back or on a phone call or in person, you know, because they have to process this, they have to Google it, they got to ask people, like, I mean, they have to sort of go through yeah. that and then come back with more questions. Also at the end, not just leaving time for questions, but how you word it. For example, if you say to someone, do you have any questions? Some people won't say yes. But if you say to them, what questions do you have? Mm -hmm. That's different because right. the assumption in the first as well, why would you need any questions? I explained it great. Whereas in the second one is clearly you're going to have questions, right? Because yeah. everyone has questions. You say something like, all right, everyone has questions. What are the questions you have that opens up so it's more inviting for questions. It's just these these real subtle things that you wouldn't think of necessarily, uh, but that's the stuff that would need to be trained and practiced and you know spoken about. And like you said, you get feedback on it. Miwa, this is really uh, great stuff. And obviously it's lovely to see you because it's always nice to see you. We've known each other a long time, but also just it has been so cool to have this relationship you know, back and forth with patients and with research and with academics and for all these years and and that we always talk about how much we appreciate having you guys around because it's just awesome and for our patients but this is also just from the podcast level so important because so many people are going to be faced with a diagnosis or a possible diagnosis and they don't know where to turn and it's just another way to get more information and just how we approach these situations just as this very very sort of floor base so people can then address their individual circumstances. Yeah. I mean, one other thing, parents do want support. And like I said, I may say, oh, the heart's corrected. But if the be if the child has behavioral issues at home or um, a genetic diagnosis in addition, I mean, I think it's helpful to offer. And we offer mentorship from families that have a child with the similar diagnosis or same diagnosis to pregnant women that just got diagnosed so that oh, they can great. talk parent to parent. because. I may see these patients in my office once a year, but I don't live with them. Right. So, you know, I have to admit that I don't know what it's like on a daily basis. So we do, I think that's important to find some, offer some areas of support. So sometimes we do offer some support group. We do have a support group for our fetal patients to meet with other families and one-on-one -on, -one on the phone. But there's also obviously like groups, um, you know, different various congenital heart groups. There's one in New York, there's one more national, um, there's Facebook groups. So that I think also um, helps families cope after a new diagnosis. Thanks for coming in, Miwa. Thanks for being Thanks, on the podcast. Amy. We're going to obviously do this again. And we'll talk about maybe specific diagnoses uh, to really, you know, do a deep dive into one of them. So if parents have one of those, they'll get to hear from the expert. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman Podcast. 
To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H-E-A-L-T-H-F-U-L-W-O-M-A-N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.